I'm going to try to keep this lively, talking about the, uh, the patient and physician needs, uh, where are the gaps, what is today's technology, and then give you a little hint and hopefully a little excitement about where we're going to be going uh, with, the future, um, uh, with the future for this field. Well, we know that uh, the patients uh, need uh, potent circulatory support. Uh, we, we, we've all known it. Uh, we know that our cardiac surgical colleagues can completely uh, take over the heart function, uh, but we've been unable to do so in the cath lab in a method that's quick, effective, uh, and without a, a lot of risk to the patient. And I think that's the need that we have right now, and, and we're all looking for that. Uh, the physician needs an affordable technology that's safe, easy to implant, and easy to manage. And, and all of these, I think, are, are, are definite needs. Uh, in terms of elective support, um, there, is a, uh, there is a need for, for support. If we look at, uh, at this data uh, from Mark Cohen, uh, published uh, in 2003, the use of balloon pumps, uh, prophylactic use of balloon pump, is actually increasing over time. And you can see that a, a large number of patients uh, now are being uh, treated in U.S. institutions in particular. And you can see the growth of numbers uh, over uh, in 2001. So there's a very high number of patients that are being used uh, 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 prophylactically uh, with balloon pumps uh, without very much uh, uh, prospective trial information. The clinicians think they need it, they want support, and um, are using it, but in terms of what the prospective randomized database for this is very minimal. So one of the things that I hope that uh, uh, we're going to be accomplishing with these trials is to provide some systematic uh, prospective scientific information to try to really understand uh, whether or not these new technologies are going to improve outcome for these patients. Uh, you could argue that, uh, well, today with the, you can do a, a left main angioplasty and five French sheath and, you know, do it all through the radial. You don't need support. But in fact, take a look at the heart, heart outcome. This is the research and T-search registries left main in the DS era. And you can see that these patients, and again, this is a prospective registry, all comers, including patients with normal ventricular function, they've got a, uh, a, an early mortality of 15%. So today in the DES era, there still is a 15% hospital mortality for these patients. So we need something to try to improve the support for these patients. If you look back at the experience that uh, we had at, the, at Beaumont Hospital uh, with balloon pumps for high-risk patients and then the CPS patients, you can see that, uh, and this is data that uh, Ted Shriver collated for us and published in the mid-90s, uh, older patients, uh, previous infarct, uh, uh, many of the patients had congestive heart failure, uh, a third of the patients had left main disease. Uh, most of the patients had a poor ejection fraction, average ejection fraction of about 30%. It, and so this is what characterized high-risk patients in the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, a poor ventricular function, multivessel or left main disease, hospital mortality of 8% for balloon pump, and a hospital mortality of 12% for CPS. And in fact, this, this data was what led us to pretty much abandon the use of CPS. It provided uh, really good hemodynamic support in the cath lab, but very, very difficult to use with lots of complications, lots of bleeding complications, and uh, ultimately really didn't look like there was really any better therapy than with the balloon pump. So we basically have started using balloon pumps for the last 10 years, uh, but still understanding that there's a very high mortality for these patients. So we're looking for more effective uh, uh, strategies to treat these patients. And uh, with that in mind, I was very privileged uh, when Abiumed asked us to participate in the PROTECT-1 study. This is the prospective feasibility trial. Again, with the uh, permission of, of the company, we, we will uh, share uh, for the first time uh, some of this outcome information on this prospective feasibility study. This, is a, this was a feasibility trial that uh, was sponsored by Abiomed uh, in order to try to get uh, this device first started for use in the United States uh, with the hope to be able to, uh, uh, to further expand the use in, in high-risk patients. So there are 20 patients in eight centers uh, treated between July of 2006 and April of 2007. These are high-risk patients uh, either had left main or last conduit an ejection fraction of less than 30%. Uh, the inclusion criteria, there were patients without, uh, that were not emergency, aged between 40 and 80, 
uh, EF less than 35%, and intervention of at least one of the following coronaries, the last patent vessel or unprotected left main. So these are high-risk patients with poor ventricular function with lots of myocardial jeopardy. Uh, won't go through a lot of the exclusion. The infarcts, cardiogenic shock were excluded, excluded LV thrombus, uh, re, uh, previous cardiac arrest. Again, aortic uh, valve disease to make sure that uh, there wasn't severe AI during the procedure or afterwards, and then severe peripheral vascular disease. Uh, the endpoints of the trial with major adverse cardiac endpoints, uh, death, MI, uh, TVR, urgent bypass, uh, or stroke, and then the primary efficacy endpoint was freedom from hemodynamic compromise. We wanted to make sure that the mean arterial pressure was maintained to at least 60 millimeters of mercury for 10 minutes uh, without need for additional pressure support. And the reason for this number is to make sure that the patients had adequate cerebral and myocardial perfusion during these high-risk interventions. Uh, a wide variety, a very, very detailed safety endpoint to make sure that with this new technology being used in the United States that we weren't harming uh, patients, uh, at least in, in the pilot study. Uh, these are the characteristics of the patients, uh, age 66, 75% uh, uh, were older than 60, the majority were male, uh, ejection fraction 26%, uh, the left prote unprotected left main in two-thirds of the patients, the last remaining conduit in 35% uh, of the patients, and you can see that uh, a substantial number of these patients had, had previous bypass or previous uh, PCI. Again, I want to emphasize older patients, really poor ventricular function, and very, very large amounts of myocardium that were in jeopardy during these procedures. Summarizing all the adverse characteristics, uh, because of the ventricular dysfunction, a large number of the patients uh, had symptomatic heart failure. Uh, many of the patients that had previous infarction, uh, renal insufficiency, diabetes. Uh, you can see that uh, some of the patients had defibrillators previously implanted. 20% uh, had mitral regurgitation. You'd expect that in these patients that have ischemic dysfunction and 15% uh, had had a history of cancer. But a very elderly, sick uh, population with multiple comorbidities, uh, very often with, uh, with overt uh, heart failure uh, as one of the presentation pre presenting symptoms. 70% uh, of the patients had left mains involved for, during the intervention. 70% had LAD. A third of the patient had the vein graft as the last remaining conduit that was being involved. And again, I would emphasize all of you that have treated these kinds of patients how high risk and how uh, potentially lethal having complications such as distal embolization and no reflow is in patients with vein grafts, especially if uh, they're the last remaining myocardium, myocardial uh, vessel that, that is present. Uh, the investigators were asked, well, if you don't have Impel available, what would you use? And you can see that 95% of the patients would have some sort of support, either with a tandem heart or with intraortic balloon pump. So uh, there is a need for some sort of support. And I think that what we wanted to demonstrate is that these patients were not just sort of low risk, uh, you're going to include them in a protocol. I think that they were very high risk, and they would have been supported by something else had, had they not had... Uh, the tandem heart employed. Uh, these are some of the uh, characteristics. The, the device was used for 1.7 hours, and you can see that the pump flow during the, during the procedure was 2.2 liters. So we were able to achieve a very good perfusion. Uh, again, I'd remind those that used to be involved with CPS that we thought that anywhere between two and, and two and a half liters was, was more than sufficient uh, forward flow during the, with the use of CPS uh, to provide the patients with adequate hemodynamic support. And it was really only used for short term because these were elective indications. Uh, safety endpoints uh, of the 20 patients, uh, one patient died in the hospital and one had sudden death uh, three weeks after the procedure. Uh, a combined total a major adverse cardiac event rates at 20%. We were asked at a previous meeting, well, how do you know this is high, low, or or not, and, and that, that's really a point because there's really very little prospective scientific data done on these patients. There's a lot of registries, there's a lot of single center experience, uh, but in terms of actually very careful collation of all of this information, it really doesn't exist. And so uh, with the, the, the PROTECT-2 trial, which we're going to be involved with, we're going to be collecting uh, very careful outcome data for these patients. So we will know uh, what the outcome for balloon pump is, and we will know what the outcome for uh, for the Impella devices, and, and I think it really will give us a great deal of information about, um, about how this procedure is being performed in the United States right now.
These are the uh, secondary endpoints. Uh, none of the patients had valve problems. Uh, none of the patients had, uh, had uh, uh, mechanical dysfunction. Uh, one patient did have renal insufficiency after the procedure, and ultimately that's what caused his demise. And we're, but we're hoping that uh, these patients are actually going to have renal protection uh, by improving renal perfusion. And in fact, anecdotally, we've seen a very brisk diuresis in many of these patients uh, after the procedure because of the improvement in, in, renal, uh, in renal blood flow. Uh, the echo, uh, uh, again, very careful assessment of, of valve function to make sure that uh, there was no damage to the aortic and mitral valve while the procedure, w while the device was deployed, and we were very confident that uh, prospectively there was no difference in, in function of the valve. Uh, hemolysis uh, is a concern. Uh, we've carefully uh, been careful to assess this. Uh, there was no uh, increase in hemolysis to the threshold that was prospectively prescribed, and so that really doesn't appear to be a problem, as, at least uh, during the short-term use. In terms of the primary uh, efficacy endpoints, freedom from hemodynamic compromise, all the patients were supported hemodynamically, and many of these patients actually with no uh, forward uh, uh, cardiac perfusion unassisted, and yet uh, none of the patients dropped their mean arterial pressure be below the threshold that, uh, that we uh, uh, wanted to, to see. Uh, there was uh, none of the patients had ventricular fibrillation requiring cardioversion and angiographic success in 95% of the patients. Uh, very importantly, uh, these patients again started with low ejection fractions, and then at one month this, the ejection fraction dramatically increased, and you can see the the, the uh, bar lot plots and many, some of these patients had actually uh, dramatic increases in ejection fraction. Presumably they had a lot of uh, hibernating myocardium and once revascularization occurred uh, with a better myocardial perfusion there was a significant improvement in ejection fraction. Uh, this is a case that uh, we were involved with, the first uh, patient that was randomized, the 64-year-old gentleman with severe coronary disease, had a combination of, uh, of uh, symptomatic angina and exertional dyspnea, uh, lots of uh, comorbidities, peripheral vascular disease, had an infarct at age 31 and had two previous bypass operations. So now he comes in uh, with a severe uh, unstable angina and, uh, and heart failure with two previous bypasses. Uh, he had severe left main disease, a proximal LED occlusion, severe d disease of his diagonal artery, 90% uh, circumflex stenosis, and a total occlusion of the right coronary artery. Um, so multivessel disease, complex intervention, multi lesions that need to be treated in someone with an ejection fraction that's very low. And this is an absolute, uh, as all of you know, that work in the cath lab know, this is an absolute uh, prescription for some calamity that's going to happen. These are the results. The patient, the procedure took about three hours. Uh, the device was implanted uh, into the right femoral artery. Uh, the pump run was for an hour and 30 minutes. And uh, he had initially rotoblader and angioplasty of the diagonal artery, uh, rotoblader and uh, stent of the left main, and then uh, rotoblader and, and stent pl implantation of the circumflex vessel. Uh, and we'll show you, I think, these angiograms. Uh, this is the patient's angiogram before the procedure. There's severe stenosis of the left main. There's a diagonal artery that's severely diseased. And very importantly, there's severe calcium in the circumflex with a 90 degree bend. And that's why um, you would say, well, you could probably just do this with balloon pump and, and get by with it or, or maybe even unassisted. But with all the calcium, we knew that we had to pretreat this with rotoblader. And uh, we were very concerned about the potential for no reflow and myocardial dysfunction during the procedure. Uh, this is uh, the result afterwards. And you can see that we were able to rotoblade and get an excellent anatomic result. Uh, he did have some uh, slow flow in the circumflex artery, uh, and uh, this needed to be treated with rapamil and nitroglycerin. Again, that would have been a calamity without support because this vessel supplied all of his viable myocardium in the inferior wall and is also has well-developed collaterals from this territory from the right corner. So the only part of his heart that was, that was contracting was his posterior wall. And uh, with uh, the slow flow with the rotobliter, I think the patient would have had hemodynamic collapse. Uh, during uh, balloon angioplasty, we inflated the balloon in the left main. And uh, again, I just wanted to see the level of support. Uh, we were able to leave the balloon inflated for three minutes 
and the patient had absolutely no chest pain and blood pressure remained uh, very stable with a mean pressure of about 80 in, in spite of the fact that there was no uh, actual uh, uh, pulse to flow. Uh, there was mean, so the patient really basically had complete support for three minutes during balloon inflation. And uh, eight, 18 months later, now returned playing golf, no further hospitalizations, significant improvement in ejection fraction. So that's kind of why we're doing all of this. I mean, we sort of talk about all of the hypotheses, but this is exactly the kind of patient that would have not really had other revascularization uh, strategies available that we're going to be able to treat with, uh, with a percutaneous device. Uh, another patient, again, just very briefly, a patient that's 67 uh, that was admitted uh, in, in, in one of our centers in Europe, a severe coronary disease. Uh, he's got severe disease of the left main coronary artery, and then the calamities that we all uh, really uh, dread, severe dissection, occlusive dissection of the left main coronary artery. And you can imagine what would have happened uh, without support. The patient would have arrested ventricular fibrillation, required cardiopulmonary support, required intubation. Hopefully, if we put a balloon pump in, then might have survived. Uh, but you wouldn't have had the time to do the complex kind of uh, patient work that you need to do to be able to get back through this occlusive dissection into the distal lumen of the arteries and then to really reestablish flow. And you can see what happened during this, during this uh, in spite of the fact that the patient basically had the left main occluded, he had pulsatile flow and adequate uh, mean arterial pressure. Again, I want to remind you that it's not just the heart that we have to support. We've got to support the cerebral circulation so the patients don't have stroke. These patients are often elderly. They've got severe atherosclerotic cerebral vascular disease, and even very sh uh, short episodes of moderate severe hypotension ca can cause neurologic dysfunction, and then they've got horrible uh, uh, arterial disease in the, in the renal circulation, so mild uh, degrees of hypotension can cause severe renal insufficiency in contrast to induced nephropathy. So these are the kind of patients that need better support. Uh, the uh, operator did a brilliant job. And you can see now that the, that the artery was, was widely open, a beautiful angiographic result, uh, reestablishment of flow into the distal vessels, and, uh, and a, a, a really a spectacular result. Uh, the patient uh, had a, a very small periprocedural MI, but basically had a non-complicated uh, convalescence and was discharged seven days after the procedure. So each one of us that did, that did, did these cases in, the, in this uh, uh, safety feasibility study has anecdotes like this where the patients really were incredibly high risk, but the procedure really was, was uh, amazingly supported uh, uh, during the intervention. Again, I showed you this data from our previous experience, and if you take a look in comparison, this is obviously not randomized, not scientific, but just for a sort of hypothesis generating. You can see that uh, with the Impella safety data that the patients uh, were uh, about the same age, uh, had previous infarction, uh, but all of these patients had multivessel disease. Uh, most of them had left main disease. Uh, all the patients had really poor ventricular function, and the average ejection fraction was quite low. And in comparison to our previous experience, uh, in hospital mortality of 5% uh, compared to 12% for CPS or 8% for balloon pump, uh, uh, this, this was a very careful assessment of paraprocedural MI uh, as opposed to clinical assessment. And uh, you can see that there was no strokes or bypasses required for these patients. So again, in a non-randomized comparison, we think that this device is, offers a, a, a wonderful safety margin, and now we're going to have to uh, prospectively uh, prove that and validate it. And uh, any of you that are not involved, uh, I'm sure that Abiumed would be very, very happy to have you involved as co-investigators in, in, in the trial, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, that trial in just a minute. So uh, observed hospital mortality for the safety trial compared to 10% predicted based on the New York State uh, database. Uh, based on the results of this pilot study that was presented in detail to the FDA, the FDA has allowed us to, uh, to begin collection of information for our, pers uh, for our perspective, PROTECT-2, which is the randomized trial that, I'll, uh, uh, that we'll talk about in just a, just a minute. Um, now, in terms of uh, recovery of the heart, emerging support, uh, this is the ISAR shock data Again, data that was presented recently, angioplasty versus balloon pump, uh, PCI versus uh, a balloon pump with a primary endpoint of hemodynamic support. And in this ISAR shock randomized trial, uh, compared to balloon pump, uh, 
uh, the impeller provided better hemodynamic support. Uh, again, I think it's going to be fantastic with uh, Jose's leadership in Europe to see whether we can prove this improvement, whether we can demonstrate that the improvement in hemodynamic support results in clinical benefit. And I think that we're going to really need to, that information, but uh, I'm very optimistic w with that. Uh, and then uh, also very intriguingly, uh, does early unloading reduce infarct size? Uh, we know that if patients are treated very early, uh, they have a very, a very low mortality, uh, but very few of the patients actually are being treated within the one to two hour time frame. The majority of patients coming in with infarct angioplasty are being treated uh, at four or more hours after symptom onset. And uh, it, 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 there's a very interesting uh, theoretic window of opportunity for use uh, for unloading the patients at the time of reperfusion to see if we can decrease infarct size in these patients that are presenting relatively late. And I think that's going to be a very important area for future, um, for future clinical investigation. Uh, this is now the Mach 2 trial that is going to be randomizing uh, and uh, standard of care versus the impella for three days. Again, we're going to be very interested in this to see in the anterior my patients whether or not uh, whether or not impella decreases uh, LV infarct size and uh, decreases uh, major adverse cardiac events. Uh, these are these are the primary endpoints, uh, and you can see that uh, that there was a, a significant difference uh, in 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 the size in the patients that were treated with impella compared to the control. So I'd like to uh, conclude that we're entering a new era of circulatory support. Uh, the, the preliminary data that we've heard tonight, I think, is always very encouraging. But uh, again, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm very encouraged uh, by the uh, scientific rigor uh, that Abiumed is really taking on to this project because there's going to be, as we presented, at least five prospective randomized trials that are going to be uh, looking at, at various places to see whether or not this therapy is better than the current standard. Uh, the paradigm is going to shift. Uh, once we have these new uh, support devices available for routine use in the cath lab, I think you're going to see widespread adoption, but that's going to be coupled with, uh, with the very rigorous perspective evaluation that we're going to be doing uh, with these randomized trials. And, and I certainly would encourage any of you that are interested in this approach to please contact us or contact Abumed because we're going to need a lot of, uh, a lot of enthusiastic, uh, scientifically rigorous investigators to help us uh, with development of this field. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, hope you have a nice evening.